With structures, you're able to define compound data types in C, just like you would define a class in Java, with the restriction that your members can only be public, what you would think of as instance variables in a Java class. We're going to have public members of a struct in C, and there aren't going to be associated methods or constructors. So really, it's just going to give us a grouping of related variables in a custom data type. So it's sort of a predecessor to the idea of an object in an object-oriented language. So a struct is a group of related variables. We call each of those related variables a member. And so just like I described earlier, this is just like having a class where all you have are public, public properties or attributes or, uh, or fields, however your programming language would define them in an object-oriented language uh, with no methods and no constructors. The way that we declare them is going to feel pretty familiar. We have the keyword struct, we give it a name, and then in the curly braces, we're going to define the grouped uh, variables. And so each variable or member of the struct is going to have a type and a name. For example, in the example we're going to be carrying out throughout this lecture, defining a st struct of name point with two double members, so x and y. So we're thinking about a 2D Cartesian coordinate point. And at this point in the lecture, I would encourage you to open up a new C file named point.c and go ahead and pause the video here and reproduce uh, this simple little program, which has a struct named point like we just saw made up of two members. And we're forward declaring a print function. We'll talk about the specific declaration of its parameter type in just a bit. And uh, we're going to have a main function and we'll uh, work with structs and get us some familiarity with them by filling out this particular example file. So pause the video here and resume once you are ready. All right. So when we declare a variable of whose type is a structure, uh, it's a little peculiar based on what we've learned in other languages. Uh, C takes this notion that structures have their own namespace. And so by default, we have to say uh, struct, and then we give the struct name and then the variable name. So for example, we could define a point variable named a point uh, whose type is struct point. All right, so let's try this in our uh, example really quickly. All right, so uh, I'm going to declare a struct point variable. So struct uh, point and the name of the variable is a point. And once we have a structure, we can access its members by the dot operator. So a point dot x is assigned, say, 1.0, and a point dot y is assigned, say, 2.0, right? And if we wanted to, there's already this implemented uh, print function down here, and we can give it a pointer to a struct point. So let's go ahead and call that function just to get a feel for uh, what's going on. So we can say point print. And we're trying to call this function that requires a parameter that has a pointer to a structure. So we need to give, need to give an address, right? So address of a point, right? And I might delete this other comment. Great. So I'm going to delete my comments. And now we've got a simple little program that's setting up a structure named point, a point, uh, and uh, has two members. The first structure that we create has an x member value of one and a Y member value of two. So just like with before, I'm going to GCC uh, pointer point dot C and dot slash a dot out. And sure enough, we get uh, some nice pretty printed uh, 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 representation here of our point. So let's just go look at that um, line 21 just a little bit more closely because this is a uh, this is a line that has some interesting syntax. So notice we are dereferencing. We have this pointer named self. Right, so this is the parameter name, and we dereference that pointer. So we're saying, hey, go read that address. And then the dot operator is looking within that structure and looking for the ops offset that the X member is stored at and reading that particular value. Same with Y. We'll see another way of doing this because this feels like kind of uh, a, a lot of syntax just to access uh, the member of a struct pointer. Um, we'll see some shorter hand syntax there. Shortly, we're going to take a look at how we make that struct keyword implicit. So the idea of uh, the struct keyword is that 
the names of your struct definitions live in their own namespace, separate from the names of, uh, say, your variables and, 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 and other uh, names in your, your primary namespace. So the same rules about locations and memory applies to structs. And this is very, very different from uh, what you've come to appreciate in a memory managed language such as Java or Python or TypeScript. Namely, this struct that we created is located in our automatic stack memory, right? So we set up a struct variable and a points members would be stored. The, this group of members would be stored in the main frame. There's no, uh, this isn't stored in the heap in any way, like it would be if we had an object in Java or Python, right? So because we declared struct point, a point to be a local variable in the main function, those two members are going to be located in that function's frame. So if we were to print out the address of this uh, a point, we would see that it's located in stack space in main's frame. And this is very different and, and means that we've now got more flexibility and control over where uh, things such as our structures are located in our programs. We can decide with whether we want them to be in static memory, in automatic memory, or in dynamic memory. And we have that control. Whereas in an object-oriented language that's memory managed, such as Java or Python, you're always going to be working with uh, reference types that are stored in the heap. And this will have some interesting implications and create some new uh, opportunities, but also some new concerns that we'll have working in a systems language that's unmanaged. To initialize a struct, we have a few options at our disposal. And one of these options is not shown to you in the book because it came about in the C99 standard. Uh, we can zero initialize all of the members of a struct by putting just a single zero in curly braces as shown here. So let me go ahead and let's update our example to demonstrate this. So we could say is assigned, we're gonna zero initialize, and maybe I'll delete the line that initializes X, right? Uh, and I can delete the line that initializes Y. Great. So I uh, now have, if I were to go run this program, and I might go ahead and say gcc point.c and a.out. So we do both of these steps at the same time. We see that we've zero initialized this value. Because uh, this struct lives on a stack frame, we have no guarantee that it would have been zero initial, its fields would have been, its members would have been zero initialized. They, it would have just been garbage without initialization. So be careful. You always, always, always want to initialize every kind of variable you use, but especially automatic variables on the stack and dynamic variables on the heap. Static variables are automatically initialized to zero on your behalf. So the C99 standard actually says this very specifically. If there were fewer initializers in the brace enclosed list, so we had two uh, members of our struct, right, X and Y, but we only had one zero here. So what does that mean? Uh, well, then what it's going to do is the remainder are going to be initially implicitly the same as objects with static duration. And wow, that's a mouthful. But we know what this means if we if we sit back and think about it. Objects with static duration are, are objects or, or, or values stored in our static memory, and their initialization is always zero uh, uh, in our program. So these this is just saying, I don't know why it's such a, a roundabout way of saying your, your other fields that are unspecified, your other members that are unspecified will be zero initialized. Now, the more common way of initializing uh, when you know the values of the, of the members that you're trying to establish is to just provide those in the same order as those members are declared in the struct declaration, right? So if we wanted to, we could declare, you know, X to be, uh, or initialize X to be 4.0 and Y to be 8.0, right? And so by providing these, uh, this initialization list and these curly braces in the order that our two members were declared in that struct, they will be initialized in that way, right? So now I could say, I uh, got that up there and four and eight are the established values. Great. So we've initialized our structure. And the key thing to remember is you always, always, always want to initialize your values. This only works. This syntax only is possible when you're declaring and initialize on the same, initializing on the same line. If you're declaring at one point in your program and trying to initialize later, or trying to just completely overwrite the, the members of a, a struct all in one go, you can't do that. There's, there's not a syntax like this for that. So uh, this only works when you're declaring and initializing at the same time. 
Again, always initialize and choose one of these. Like if you don't know what you're going to initialize to, I would encourage you to just go ahead and zero them out, right? This is your de facto default uh, standard. Uh, just always remember this, commit it to memory, right? So here's what you wanna do when you, when you don't have any values specifically to establish for your members. But the second line shows you, uh, the second example shows you what you would do if you did have a sense of, of how to initialize uh, each of the, the members of your struct. Because typing the keyword struct in front of the name of the struct feels verbose and a little bit redundant, and it feels a little bit unnatural in the way we've come to experience programming in the late uh, 20 teens and 2020, uh, we tend to use a type def to avoid having to write struct each time we want to refer to a structure type. So what we're going to do is we're going to declare an alias for a structure. And before we get to looking at how we would do that with a structure, let's look at how we would do that with some other type. And in fact, this is happening behind the scenes in say standard int.h when you're using things like uint64 underscore t, these wind up being type defs uh, that are set up for you uh, in those header files. So we could rename the idea of what an unsigned int is to be whole number, right? So we can say type def, existing type name, uh, and then the new name of our new type, right? So if we wanted to define uh, unsigned int to have an alias that is whole number, after we set up that type def, we could then establish variables whose types are whole number, for example. And this is a bit of a silly example, um, but let's look at what we can, how we would use this with a structure. So a lot of times you'll find that de declaring a type uh, struct with a uh, with a type def makes your programs more legible once you're comfortable with the idea of it. So what we're going to do is say uh, there's two options, right? So we can say type def struct and then the name of the, the the structure's declaration and then the new name that we want to give it on its own, right? For example, two common things that you'll see in uh, C programs are type def struct point. So this is the, the structure that we declared. And then you could give a name like point underscore T. And this might be convention conventional in some organizations, or you might take what feels like a more modern approach and use a capital letter, like a class name. And notice that, it, wow, that seems kind of funky where we're saying struct point is being alias to just point. And, and uh, that's kind of the point, right? So we're saying, the word point now means struct point. All right. If you did this and you could do both of these things in the same program, I would encourage you not to set up multiple aliases for the same type unless they have substantially different semantics and how you would use them. Uh, you could use them with the same effect in the same program, just like are shown on the slide here. So let's try looking at how we would uh, do this and then look at uh, uh, and then we'll look at one other variation that's that's even more common. So we could say type def uh, struct point, and we're naming it point, right? And when you see this without the syntax highlighting that was shown on the slides that I tried to, to uh, delineate, okay, struct point is the existing type, and then the last point it token here is is the point that we're the alias that we're setting up. This feels a little bit confusing to read, right? That that feels kind of funky. But once we do this. We no longer have to, I can delete this usage of the word struct here, right? So we can say that point print is going to take a pointer uh, to a point structure and its name is self, right? So I could do the same thing uh, down here. And additionally, this use of the word struct when I declared my variable, a point to be a struct point, uh, we don't have to use that struct keyword there anymore either. So we've changed, we've introduced a new type and it's just this type name point. And this feels, this is starting to feel a little bit more natural and modern, right? This, this feels pretty comfortable. And if we wanted to, we could compile this and convince ourselves it works, and that's great. It turns out though, that having to do this on a separate line from your structure's uh, declaration feels uh, like it's easy to forget and it keeps that knowledge in two different places. So there's a way of doing this all in one step. So once again, if we consider the idea that we're saying type def and then our type that we're referencing and then the new name, well, we can actually convert this pattern that we just saw and implemented to something that uh, is all done in one statement effectively, right? So we can combine these two steps into one and say type def struct, and then the name of that struct is point. Uh, and then we give the members of that struct. And then after the closing curly brace, that's when we're setting up the new name or the alias of this type definition for it to be point. 
So let's go ahead and to have a, an example of this in our code, change this example to that. So I'm gonna comment out uh, this and say, this is the same as above. And uh, we're saying type def struct point and the alias that we're giving it is point. Right? Now this feels, if you see this for the first time, and I actually had some anecdotes from uh, students who uh, of, I know who are in operating systems this semester and saw this exact same concept and, and, and much of the class was like totally confused by why is point declared twice? What's going on? This feels like a lot. But once you know how we got to this point, uh, <laughs> I, I am, had, once you know how we got to this point, uh, it, it hopefully makes sense in that we're, this is the type that we're declaring and we can declare that as part of the type def statement. And so we're saying this type that we're declaring is going to be aliased to the type point, All right? Same thing, great. You might be wondering, you know, we've got this name point here twice, struct point and point. Could we just have what's called an anonymous structure? And you probably saw this in the book and just say type def struct and then your members uh, and then point. And the answer is yes, but there are some limitations. And we'll see in an upcoming lesson, in fact, the next lesson, that when we want to use recursive structs, so you could think of a linked list struct as, as like the simplest example of what might be a recursive struct, where you refer to uh, one of your members as, as referring to another struct of the same type. The only way to achieve that uh, in C is if we include both the struct definition type. So we're, we're introducing a struct named point. So we could still use the, the type struct point uh, and then we're aliasing it for later in our program. But if within this structure, we wanted to refer to something of type struct point, uh, we would have to give it a name as part of that structure declaration, that structures types declaration. Right? So with that in mind, we're just going to establish a habit in this course of always effectively having this redundancy and, and, in, and declaring a name for the structure as well as this type alias that doesn't force us to use it. I would encourage you to try pausing the video here and tracing the following code in uh, on paper. How would you imagine the memory uh, uh, is a, how would you imagine the following code listing is uh, in sort of a hand-waving way would be evaluated when uh, the, the processor tries to move through this main function. So go ahead and pause the video here and uh, then we'll work through it together. Okay, so for those of you who uh, took Comp 110 with me, you know that there are some conventions that we might use that uh, in how we would trace one of these diagrams. And, and we've been learning in the through the course of this uh, Comp 211 that some of the things that we do uh, when we're introducing memory concerns to uh, introductory programming courses are um, we're not giving the full picture and, and we're not even going to give quite the full picture here. We're going to do this in a hand-waving way. Um, but for the purposes of aligning with what we've done in the past, we could imagine, uh, you know, I'm going to set up two areas of my memory. So I'm going to have a, my stack and I'm actually going to put, now that we know about it, uh, the heap down below. You know, in 110, we said it's just some other place. It's located off uh, in, in the oblivion somewhere. And uh, we know now that actually they're all part of the same memory space. Uh, one is just located in a different segment uh, than the other. And so we've got our mainframe. And we don't really know what its return address is. So we're, we're not going to bother ourselves with details like that. So now the question is, well, how do we represent these things? Uh, and, and where does a point like this a variable go well if we were being very pedantic we would realize uh, some things like the way these get laid out are you know typically uh, because remember our, our stack is going from small to high in terms of addresses like a would wind up being located towards the bottom or the start of the mainframe stack uh, if we were to look at how C actually aligned these things I'm not gonna get into that level of detail and intentionally we're gonna be kind of loose here. What I wanna focus on is what are we actually passing around and what are we actually doing here uh, when, we, when we set up these variables. So when we set up point A, it's setting up, and I'm, I'm gonna write A here, it's not actually something that lives on the stack. Uh, this is 
the variable name a is for our purposes, the compiler would just establish the memory space to store uh, the two members of our struct. So it would have space for x and y, right? And both of these would be initialized to zero. Uh, and notice this isn't a reference to the heap or anything like that, or a pointer. We are setting up a struct named a uh, in, in assigned or bound to the variable name a in our program. Its initial values are zero and zero. Now we set up b. What is b? Well, here, uh, this is where the notion that this is actually a stack value in automatic memory becomes important. So we have B and B is going to be a copy of A. So B is going to be a complete copy of A. It's a value, right? All right. And then we set up a pointer to a point, right? So we read these declarations backwards, a pointer to a point struct, and it's named C. So what is C? Well, I'm going to get rid of the heap. It turns out there's no heap used in this. There's no malloc, calloc, or realloc, right? So there's, we're not using any of the heap here. So C is going to be a pointer, and it's given the address of A, right? So in 110, we would reference, we would represent a pointer as an arrow to a value. But we know now that A is going to have some memory address, uh, OX, we'll call it 8, right? So C would actually store the memory address of whatever A is. And I just made that up, right? But it would be somewhere in this frame. Now, again, uh, there are some lies in this diagram that are very significant. The, the variable names, the structure member names, all of that information would not be compiled or, or be found in the stack frame. We're doing that so that we can just sort of keep track of that as humans reasoning through this, right? So now the question is what happens when we dereference C and change its X member uh, to 1.0. Okay, so C is OX8. So when we dereference it, we're talking about this struct here. And when we change its X parameter to 1.0, we would indeed be changing that value, which is also uh, A's X member, uh, if we were to go read A, All right? So on the last line here, we see that A.X would be print 1.0 b.x would print 0, 0.0 and then dereference c.x would print 1.0 right so notice this behaves differently than if you tried to write a very similar program using classes in java or typescript or python uh, and you tried to replicate this you wouldn't be able to because uh, the idea that a struct value can be stored as a true value in a stack frame and copied just like any other stack frame value to another uh, variable uh, of, of its own name, like we did on this line, that's not possible in memory in most memory managed languages, right? So this is a different outcome than you would have expected if you tried to trace a very similar program in Java, because there you're passing around references, which are implicit pointers. Here we set up a pointer, and notice that's a, another thing that we couldn't do in Java or Python. We can't have a pointer to a stack value, whereas here C referred to a local variable that happened to be a uh, struct. All right, so let's continue on. When you have a struct value that is an automatic variable located on your stack, or in static memory, you can access its members directly like this. You can say the name of the struct variable dot and then the member name, right? You can assign to these things. This feels pretty, pretty natural. We can take the address of a structure and that will be the address of the first byte of that structure's uh, location in memory. We can copy all members of a struct from one place to another. And this is actually kind of interesting. So notice here, I'm actually uh, trying to demonstrate something that's perhaps non-intuitive because this is not, uh, this is also something that doesn't work in the same way in a, a memory managed language. So notice we have a point pointer whose type is a pointer to a point, And we are setting up a new, in this case, it would be called an automatic stack variable named a copied point. And uh, we're copying a point, which would have been, you know, had the values one and two to it. But on this line, and this line is making use of this, this pointer that we've set up, 
uh, we can do the same thing via a pointer, right? So not only can we uh, uh, copy, and I, and I don't have an example of what some other point is, but uh, the, the point is that's some other point. Uh, this is imagine some other struct point. Uh, we can actually take all of its members and copy them to some address pointed to by a point pointer and, and copy all members in one statement like this, right? It would, it, behind the scenes, it would be multiple instructions or operations, but, but here uh, we've, got, we've got single statements. So there's a big difference between a copy of a struct and a pointer to a struct, and be careful of that distinction, right? So in memory managed languages, you are always copying pointers effectively. Here we can actually make true copies of structures, uh, and, and you've gotta be careful to know which one you're doing and, and which one to use at the right time. We can demonstrate this with the following function. Consider this function uh, and try and think through, reason through uh, what its output might be. And I would encourage you to pause the video at this point and not only try reasoning through this, uh, what you expect the outputs to be, um, but then try actually running this program and convincing yourself that you know how it would work by writing this in your uh, demo file that we're working on. All right. so. Let's see if you uh, reason through this as, as would make sense. Uh, so because this is a quite different world we're living in than a memory managed language, uh, don't be surprised if, if this doesn't uh, click in the very first try or two, but let's get some practice with this. So without diagramming this in its entirety, uh, let's go ahead and just reason through the important function call that's happening here, right? So we've got two points set up, A and B, and A's values are 1.0 and 2.0 for X and Y, 3.0, 4.0 for B's X and Y respectively. And then we reach this line. And what happens when this function call to add occurs, okay? Well, notice each of these parameter types is just a struct type, right? So this is the, the type we aliased. So these are going to be local variables. They're not pointers. They're certainly not in the heap. We, again, we see no dynamic memory allocation happening here. So this is all happening in automatic memory. And so if we were to imagine, well, what actually does happen with add? Uh, I said I wasn't gonna draw a memory diagram, but uh, let's just, let's go for it uh, really quickly. So A uh, has 1.0 and 2.0, and B has uh, 3.0 and 4.0, all right? And I'm not even gonna get more specific than that with the fields because we know that they're ordered X and then Y. So what happens when we call add? Well, another frame gets established and add has a point P1 set up. And it's also going to have uh, 1.0 because we called the, the first parameter here was A and 2.0 as it's the values of its two members. And P2 is gonna have 3.0 and 4.0, right? And notice that these are copies. We actually made copies of these structures into the frame for add. So when we go and think about, well, what happens when these two lines are evaluated? Well, uh, p1.x is increased by p2.x. So p2.x is three, p1.x is one. So this is gonna be four, right? p1.y is increased by p2.y. So p1.y is two, four, so this would be six, right? So p1, is four and six and p2 is three and four within the uh, the frame for add and the reason why we evaluated you know p1 was uh was local to this function in this frame so then when we reach this return p1 well our return value is effectively going to be a copy of this particular struct set of struct uh, members right so we're copying that back to wherever we return and uh if i wanted to be pedantic here you know we're returning four and six, so this the, the two members here, and we're going back to where this call occurred and assigning that to a variable C, which I've kind of run out of space for in mains frame, but uh, let's actually, we can delete this, right? So four and six are the return value. I'll leave that for a second, and let me redraw mains outline here, give myself a little bit more space. So this variable C in main is gonna now have 4.0 and 6.0 as its two member uh, values. Right? And so when we go to print these, A is unchanged in, in mains frame because we copied that value in. And now this is different from 
a, something, a concept that we spent a lot of time thinking about in, in earlier courses where we're passing around references or effectively pointers, right? So in some ways, this is actually simpler and, and more intuitive. You learned more complex rules to understand how references got passed in uh, a memory managed class. And those same rules will apply if we're passing pointers around. And we'll look at that in an upcoming lesson. But for now, know that you are copying around uh, members of a given structure. So there's one other thing I want to introduce in this example uh, before closing uh, this introduction to structs. Notice that when we set up these two variables, a point and a point pointer, uh, one is a a, a regular struct that's an automatic or static variable, depending on where you declared it. And the other is certainly a pointer variable, right? With C, there's some syntactical sugar we can use to not have to use this dereference uh, and then uh, dot operation, right? So we saw this in the print function that, that we looked at earlier. So this arrow notation is saying, hey, dereference this pointer. So this, this syntax only works when the variable to the left-hand side of it is a pointer. Dereference that pointer and then go look for this specific member within that structure. All right, so let's try uh, actually replacing uh, or rewriting our print function so that it uses this shorthand syntax. So what we're saying here is instead of uh, star self.x, we can say self arrow x and self Oops, arrow y, right? And that's the same thing, right? So these two uh, syntax is are exactly the same as one another. We haven't changed anything about the code that was written, uh, but this arrow notation, when you're trying to access the member of a pointer to a struct is way handier than uh, dereference, then dot. And you have to put that dereference in parentheses because otherwise it looks like in some instances it might be a multiplication operator due to operator precedence. So uh, this is why this arrow syntax is introduced. And it's kind of nice because it's like, it's kind of like we're following that pointer, right? We're following the arrow. If we'd used arrows instead of addresses to that, uh, whatever structure we're referring to, and then looking at its members for uh, the actual value stored there. You can also do this for what are called L values or the, the symbols that you see on the left-hand side of the assignment operator. So in assignment statements, we can uh, assign to a member of a pointer to a struct uh, using this arrow syntax as shown on this slide. When you're working with pointers to structs, this syntax is going to be strongly preferred. So this is a quick introduction to structures. In the upcoming lessons, we'll look at two uh, uh, nuances that are, are, when we start to use these in practice, there are some uh, conventions that we'll wanna learn about how to write functions that either take in uh, pointers to structures and how we might communicate how we're using those pointers so that we can write uh, more rigorous programs that we are more confident in by knowing whether or not that function plans to mutate that pointer or not. And we'll also look at some conventions about how we might set up functions that return multiple values through what we call out parameters or pointers to uh, that we expect the function to write to uh, or mutate. And then we'll take a look at how we can define recursive structures, which will be important when we start to need to represent things such as trees or linked lists and, and more complex data structures in our programs. So this is an introduction to structs in C. Great work. I would encourage you to play around with the file that we set up and uh, try writing some more functions to get a feel for it.